Hello, and thank you for joining this session entitled Developing Effective State Plans for Marine Shellfish Restoration. My name is Aaron Kornbluth. I'm an officer with the PU Charitable Trusts based out of our Washington, D.C. office. If you've joined this session, you probably already know that native marine shellfish populations are in decline. This session will focus on coastal species such as clams, mussels, bay scallops, and especially oysters. Although there are a few truly global assessments of these declines, this map from Beck et al. 2009 shows how many areas have experienced near total losses of native species of oysters. More local scale assessments and on the water knowledge tell us largely the same story. The impacts of those declines have been widespread and hard felt, with many areas experiencing significant declines in shellfish available for wild harvest, reduced habitat for other marine wildlife, degradation of shorelines and water quality, and impacts on coastal communities. Restoration is something that has been ongoing for a long time, in many places, using many techniques, with varying degrees of success. There remains a lot more to do and a lot of opportunity. To date, people are trying out some really promising novel techniques like restoring multiple species in close proximity to one another, like using man-made high relief structures to encourage more growth and using novel hatchery rearing techniques. Restoration is happening both in rural as well as urban areas. Despite these efforts, in many areas, native shellfish populations continue to decline or fail to increase in number. Because shellfish restoration is so challenging, we need to take advantage of all of the tools in the toolbox available to us. These are many, though this presentation will focus on developing strategic, large-scale restoration plans. The title of this presentation refers to state plans because that is the context in which many efforts in the U.S. are taking place. But certainly such large-scale restoration plans can be estuary-specific, regional, as in a number of states working with each other, national, or even international. The restoration plans that this panel will discuss are not the same as the plans often used to guide individual restoration projects, but instead those that seek to piece together the many aspects and goals of larger scale restoration in a given area, often combining or even creating opportunities for multiple projects. We also distinguish plans from resource management plans, shellfish fishery management plans, and ad hoc regulations or policies about shellfish though all of the above can be included as elements in a larger restoration plan and should certainly be factored in. In my experience though, restoration is an often overlooked aspect of some of these other types of shellfish management plans. In this presentation, I'm joined by four panelists that represent four U.S. East Coast states, each of which is at varying stages in developing its own comprehensive shellfish restoration plan. The panelists are leaders within their respective planning processes hailing from a variety of institutions, types of institutions, including a state natural resource agency, an urban oyster restoration nonprofit that partners with high school students and volunteers, academia, and a state nonprofit. After the four panelists have presented, I will provide a brief wrap up and overview to highlight some of the common themes, best practices, challenges, and lessons learned before we turn to the live Q&A. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Eric Schneider. I'm a biologist with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management Division of Marine Fisheries and a PhD student at Northeastern University's Department of Marine and Environmental Science. As part of today's panel, Developing Effective State Plans for Marine Shellfish Restoration, I'll be talking about beginning the process of developing a statewide shellfish restoration and enhancement plan for Rhode Island. First, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our current partners, contributors, and funding sources. We have an extensive team, and I'll show this slide again at the end of the talk. This partnership brings together the primary agency responsible for oyster reef restoration decision making in Rhode Island, which is the Rhode Island DEM Division of Marine Fisheries, with team members from Northeastern University's Department of Marine and Environmental Science, the Pew Charitable Trust, University of Rhode Island Coastal Resource Center, the Rhode Island Chapter of the Nature Conservancy, the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, as well as the Rhode Island Shellfish Initiative, the Rhode Island Shellfish Restoration Working Group, and the Southern New England Program of Restore America's Estuaries. For today's talk, I'll be providing some background on oyster populations and restoration in Rhode Island. I'll discuss why a shellfish restoration and enhancement plan is needed. And please note that for the rest of the talk, I'm going to abbreviate shellfish restoration and enhancement plan as SREP. I'll briefly discuss our vision, anticipated approach and challenges, and conclude with next steps. Before I begin, I'd like to address one question up front, and that is, is Rhode Island pursuing a shellfish or an oyster restoration plan? 
The answer is a statewide shellfish restoration plan. Although oysters are the focus species for the initial restoration planning, the process will seek stakeholder input on all Rhode Island Minas shellfish species. And it's our hope that the plan will expand over time to other species such as hard clam or quahog, soft shell clam, and bay scallop. In Rhode Island, eastern oyster reef habitat is found primarily in shallow subtidal waters of the coastal lagoons and estuaries. When intact, oyster reefs provide a wide array of ecosystem services, such as removing excess nitrogen and enhancing water quality, providing nursery habitat for economically valuable fish and invertebrates, and stabilizing coastal shorelines. Like most populations along the eastern seaboard, wild populations in Rhode Island have been severely degraded due to overharvesting, habitat loss, and disease, with current estimates at less than 1% historic levels. Degradation of oyster reef habitat has resulted in the loss of ecosystem services that many of our Rhode Island coastal communities rely on. In response, for more than two decades, oyster restoration and enhancement has been conducted via partnerships and collaborations between many entities in Rhode Island, including the Rhode Island DEM Division of Marine Fisheries, the Nature Conservancy, Northeastern University, USDA NFCS, Roger Williams University, University of Rhode Island, NOAA Fisheries, and Aquaculturists. Despite improvements in restoration techniques, these projects have not yet the primary restoration goal of establishing self-sustaining reefs. In addition, the current planning and permitting process is constraining restoration efforts. This approach focuses on individual locations with current oyster-related information, which largely inhibits new restoration work in areas with little or no oyster habitat information. Furthermore, developing restoration approaches for discrete sites rather than on a statewide approach makes it challenging to maintain stakeholder engagement. There is also concerns over use conflicts and frustration that there's no collective plan with quantitative goals and targets. In light of these issues, the groups below, which includes the Rhode Island DEM Division of Marine Fisheries, the Shellfish Initiative, the Rhode Island Shellfish Restoration Working Group, and recommendations within the Rhode Island Shellfish Management Plan, all recognize the need for an overarching plan that considers the needs of scientists and stakeholders and utilizes the full suite of information available to address social and ecological data gaps. To the right, there is a map of Quantocatog Pond. This illustrates an area that is both data rich, but still lacks information on wild oyster distribution and oyster habitat suitability. It also shows that there's many overlapping uses and initiating new restoration and enhancement efforts um, has been challenging. Although not specifically a need, Rhode Island has a number of unique attributes that may help support the development of a statewide shellfish restoration and enhancement plan. First, Rhode Island is small and densely populated. We never more than an hour from the ocean or bay, which allows many residents of the ocean state to have experiences with or exposure to Narragansett Bay and our coastal waters. Overall, Rhode Islands have a strong sense of place and tend to form connections to specific locations and experiences. Past work has shown that Rhode Islanders generally care about the health of the bay and are supportive of habitat and shellfish initiatives. There is also interest in spatial planning, largely aimed at helping to resolve conflicts of use. We're also fortunate that in Rhode Island we have a history of working collaboratively together on shellfish initiatives. Considering these needs and the Rhode Island specific attributes, our current vision is to have a cohesive, overarching statewide plan that uses a transparent and open process that incorporates social and ecological information with a focus on considering the needs of stakeholders and managers while minimizing user conflicts. To maximize the likelihood of success, we need to engage stakeholders and utilize their input to scope restoration goals and targets and maintain their support throughout the project. We also need to leverage partnerships, utilize existing technical expertise, and look to science to inform our restoration and enhancement practices. Again, our approach has not been finalized, so I won't get into specific actions or methods. However, we anticipate using a social ecological system approach that can be distilled into the flowchart below. We're still in the first node or box process development. As we move into the second node, information collection, we begin to engage stakeholders to discuss what ecosystem services and locations are important to them, discuss goals and targets for restoration. We'll also collect information on restored and wild oyster populations to address some of our ecological data gaps. We'll then move into the third node, 
where we'll use the information collected thus far in the process to develop a model that incorporates social, ecological, and management information to identify spatially explicit restoration and enhancement goals and targets, as well as identify sites across Rhode Island waters that is suitable for restoration. These outputs will be incorporated into a draft plan that will go through the public vetting process prior to being finalized. The final note is published in the plan, which is actually just a transition to the next stage of implementation. But for now, we'll focus on getting to, to that final note. Some of the challenges we face have been just getting started. We've recognized this need and explored opportunities for a number of years. However, Rhode Island has limited dedicated funding for shellfish work, and really no funding that can support an initiative like this. Thus, we've worked with partners to develop approaches and pursue funding opportunities. At the moment, we have funding from a few sources, which include the Southern New England Program of Restore America's Estuaries, the Pew Charitable Trust, and NRCS, as well as support from many partners that can be used to begin and initiate this process. We're optimistic that once initiated, we'll be able to continue to obtain the funds needed to complete the process. Under normal circumstances, initiating and maintaining stakeholder interest is challenging, but under the current COVID-19 conditions, we're trying to be open-minded and develop a process that maximizes opportunities for stakeholder engagement remotely. These might include a combination of crowdsourcing, online surveys, webinars, and workshops, a few of our next steps are to have a joint meeting of our primary partners and finalize the shellfish restoration and enhancement process and roles. We plan to have a virtual kickoff event um, at the end of 2020 and begin data assembly and social and ecological work in the spring of 2021. Throughout this time and the years to come, we'll have to continue to seek and find funding to support this. I'd again like to acknowledge our current partners and funding sources. I appreciate your time and would be happy to address questions during the panel discussion. Hello, thank you so much for joining our session. My name is Pete Malinowski. I'm the executive director at Billion Oyster Project. It's a small nonprofit located in New York City that works to restore oyster reefs through public education initiatives. I'm going to be talking about the work that's <clears throat> happened in New York State to get us to the point of sitting down to develop a state plan for marine shellfish restoration. I'll give a quick shout out to Aaron Kornbluth from Pew and uh, for his support in getting us to this point and support getting the, our uh, session together. I also want to say that the, the presentation here focuses a lot on the work that we've done in New York City. Um, and I just want to shout out the other folks out on Long Island, at Cornell Cooperative Extension, and SUNY Stony Brook, who have been doing a lot of fantastic work along a similar time frame. So here goes. A little bit about me. I grew up on the Fishers Island Oyster Farm, small family-run farm east of Long Island and grew up working with my parents and siblings um, on the farm. And so I came first from the commercial side and then got into restoration after moving to New York. The Billion Oyster Project, like I said, is a nonprofit. The core tenant of our work is that the best way to improve outcomes for public school students and the natural environment is to train students to restore the environment. So we develop educational programs that have real world implications and work products for students that apply directly to the, our restoration work. And we design restoration work that's accessible to young people and try to find different ways to engage young people in the work of restoring the natural environment where they live. <clears throat> New York City the, is a common tale to many of the great estuaries in the world, but New York City, um, before it was colonized by Europeans, was this you know, fantastic, rich, dynamic, and productive ecosystem as are most big estuaries in the world. And similar to other big estuaries, now there's a huge city sitting right on top of it. But when Europeans first arrived in New York, they described finding more fish than they would ever need and you know, not being able to see the sky for minutes at a time because of all the birds flying overhead. Obviously, that type of abundance doesn't really exist in the world anymore because it's been removed by humans. And the same story is true in New York. So pretty early on, the oysters in New York City became famous and people would travel from all over the world to try New York City oysters. Um, the, there were oyster carts on every street corner. They were enjoyed by rich and poor alike. And not surprisingly, the, um, the natural oyster reefs could not withstand that type of harvest. And so by the early 1800s, most of the natural reefs have been removed from New York Harbor, um, primarily you know, as, as a food 
food source. And that led that and the development of the Croton Aqueduct system, which allowed New York City to, the population of New York City to balloon and also resulted in the rapid decline of water quality in the harbor because all of the um, runoff from people's homes went right out into the harbor. So that combined with using the rivers and bays primarily as a system of waste conveyance and rather than considering them to be a valuable natural resource led to the destruction of the ecology of New York Harbor. And here you can see you know, both a, an oyster cart but also a, um, a trash barge just shoveling trash in, into the harbor, which was a standard practice for a long time. So that takes us to today, where we have this huge city, 8 million people living surrounded, you know, on this collection of islands surrounded by this huge natural harbor um, and largely going about their daily lives without having any direct interaction with the harbor. So we say a billion oyster project that most streets in New York end at the water's edge, but most New Yorkers don't identify as living in a port city or living, in, um, living on the water. And that's so part of our work is to change that by finding ways to engage the general public in the work of restoring oysters because we believe that uh, direct engagement in a large-scale restoration project is the best way to build awareness and affinity for the natural resource. The first big group planning effort um, was the development of the Comprehensive Restoration Plan, which was led by the Army Corps of Engineers and involved dozens of stakeholders, both the government, nonprofit, university level. And this document um, developed target ecosystem characteristics that were sort of slated for restoration throughout the harbor and goals, targets for you know, how much of that should be restored. Oyster reefs were one of those target ecosystems and the goals set in the plan was 500 acres of restored reef by 2015 and 5,000 by 2050. Now neither of these goals, well, the 2015 goals were, were not reached and uh, we're not currently on track for the 2050 goals either, but this was the first time that a whole uh, group of different stakeholders came together to develop a comprehensive plan for restoring oysters in New York. There are a number of reasons that you know we're we're, behind, we're, we're not on that we're not trending towards those goals now. Uh, big is the lack of coordination. Uh, the challenges in 2009. There wasn't uh, a lot of coordination between the different stakeholders who needed to come together to do the work. It was really challenging to get permission to put oyster reefs in the water and the scale of the installations were limited through the permitting process. A big reason for that is the attractive nuisance issue. So because oysters are a foodstuff and restored oysters and oysters restored to contaminated waters can be seen as a public health risk, that has been a real challenge to, to work through. And we've made some good progress, but back in 2008, 2009, when we started putting oysters in the water, that fear of poaching and fear of, of human consumption of the oysters was a big limiting factor. Um, we really didn't have a lot of technical understanding about how to grow and restore oysters and where we should do it, and there remains an enormous amount to learn, but we've definitely made some big strides in the last 10, 11 years in uh, building our understanding. Uh, the, the comprehensive restoration plan didn't carry with it any funding, and so that's been a, a limiting factor is identifying appropriate funding streams for large-scale installation. And then lastly, there were not a ton of there hadn't been a lot of pilot scale projects. So that brings us to, that, to the uh, Oyster Restoration Research Project. It was a collaboration between the Hudson River Foundation, the New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, New York Harbor School, the University of New Hampshire, and, um, and the Port Authority. It was the first time that there was a, a set of pilot reefs um, installed throughout the harbor to be used as a, as a research platform. As that project was winding down, New York City was hit with Hurricane Sandy. Um, and that was a major inflection point in how the city and the, and the state generally in the region thinks about resiliency, um, edge design, and using natural infrastructure or nature-based solutions as part of proactive planning for climate change, rising water levels, and more intense storms. Um, so that was a, uh, brought, a, shined a spotlight on the work of oyster restoration and other resiliency efforts. It also established the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery to help rebuild New York in a more resilient way. The Governor's Office of Storm Recovery launched the Living Breakwaters Project um, to protect a town on the southern end of Staten Island that was hard hit by Hurricane Sandy. The, um, the Living Breakwaters Project is unique in that it, it combines shoreline armament structures with ecological 
enhancements. And so the breakwaters are actually designed to incorporate elements of oyster restoration into the design of the breakwaters. Um, also through the process of developing this project, we started using the term social resiliency and thinking about how a restored oyster population and educational programs can be a component of building resiliency at a community level. The next key project for us was the Head of Bay Oyster Pilot Project. This is important. It was the largest installation to date. And it was also the first time that New York City came in in a real way to um, fund a major oyster restoration effort. The project was motivated, uh, you know, funded by the Department of Environmental Protection and motivated by a desire to improve water quality in Jamaica Bay. It involved the construction of four um, reef, base, reef bases made of oyster shell and crushed porcelain, and then a donor nursery that was flowed over top full of um, large adult oysters. And the idea was that by putting some larvae into the system with the donor nursery, we could see if we could sort of complete the life cycle in one place. We didn't get a lot of recruitment on the reefs, but now the, um, the large adult oysters have been installed directly on the base, the reef bases. The new Mario Cuomo Bridge, which is shown here, um, during the environmental impact research, it was discovered that there were uh, existing oyster reef populations in and around the area of the bridge. And so the Thruway Authority, as part of their permit, were required to restore some of the, some of the habitat that was destroyed by the construction. And so this was the first time for us that oyster reefs played a role in, in mitigating the environmental impact of a large project. And we worked with the New York Harbor School, University of New Hampshire, the Hudson River Foundation, and AKRF, it's a big engineering firm, to develop the plan and do the installation. This also established an oyster restoration work group that helped advise on the project. takes us to our big project for this year, which is the Soundview Oyster Reefs. And this is a key project for us because it, um, it moves our primary regulator, the Department of Environmental Conservation, from, from being solely a regulator to, to being a more of a project partner. And so the, the, the funding for this project comes through DEC. They're a major player now in restoring oysters both in New York City and also out of Long Island. And they've been a great partner to us and has allowed us to dramatically scale up our work. So our new remote setting facility in Brooklyn in Red Hook. And this show this is a um, this facility was funded by the Department of Environmental Conservation for the Soundview Reefs and has allowed us to dramatically scale up the uh, our installations. So sort of on a parallel time frame, the governor a couple years ago announced the shellfish, this Long Island shellfish restoration project, which is a $10.4 million project to restore oysters to the, to the bays on the south side of Long Island. And this is obviously a massive commitment from the state government and continues to build on the, the work that's happened on both on Long Island and in New York City. A key component of this project was the establishment of a shellfish restoration council. And this, for the first time, brought together Billion Oyster Project with Cornell, Cornell uh, Cooperative Extension and um, Stony Brook University. And the, the, the three organizations came together to co-chair the Restoration Council. And the Restoration Council shown here is a, a very interesting mix of um, nonprofit leaders, state and local government, um, and various environmental fishermen's associations, aquaculture associations, um, the Nature Conservancy, and the goal of the council originally was to, to was to advise on and sort of monitor the progress of the Long Island shellfish restoration project. And now we're reconvening the council with support from Pew and from Aaron to uh, develop a new regional plan. The reason we need a regional plan because we all face common challenges around water quality, similar research questions. Um, we want to develop a plan so that we can get increased buy-in from government agencies, more planning and coordinating of research to develop and build best practices that can be shared and accepted by you know, various stakeholders, and um, maybe most importantly, to think about the whole system solution. So what does oyster restoration on this grand scale look, look like? What does the state need to restore both the bays in Long Island, the you know, Long Island Sound, and um, New York Harbor? 
And lastly, because there are different stakeholders with different needs in aquaculture, restoration, and wild harvest, all taking place in New York State, you know, how can we avoid, avoid the inevitable conflicts and bring everyone together around a common plan? So that's it for me. Um, here's the beautiful East River. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm looking forward to questions at the panel. Hi, my name is Elizabeth North, and I'm here to talk about Oyster Futures, where we tested a collaborative process to restore an oyster resource industry and ecosystem in an estuary. Oyster Futures had a great team of scientists working to support it. Oysters, as you know, are important. They're important for food, for livelihoods, for cultural heritage, and for the ecosystem and water quality. Massive restoration efforts have been undertaken by many partners in Chesapeake Bay and in Maryland. Yet, conflict about how to bring the oyster back remains. But what if stakeholders could agree? What if they could agree, agree about what to do in the Chop Tank region where there's large scale sanctuaries? They already did. These are the oyster future stakeholders. How could this have happened? Well, we use the consensus solution process. It's designed to be fair, transparent, powerful, and representative. It provides a respectful place for people to speak their truth to power and to each other. The consensus in the process, the stakeholders, managers, and scientists sit at the same table and they work out fishing regulations and restoration policies, which then they recommend it to the government. And it's the stakeholders who are at the center of the process. The stakeholders propose the re proposed or revised options. Then the stakeholders and the scientists combine knowledge together, in our case, in a collaborative model. And stakeholders review the model predictions, and then they would revise their options or propose new ones. So all these options for bringing the, the resource back were tested and modeled uh, over and over again until they came up with a package of options that had 75% agreement, which um, advanced onward. And once that package of options and recommendations about what to do was developed, then they had one vote, one vote only, and on the entire package of options. And in our case, uh, they came to consensus. So I'll tell you about how they got there. They tested the consensus. Our objectives was to test the consensus solutions process. This was a research project, and we were focusing on oyster fishing regulations and restoration policies. And our study site was the Chop Tank and Little Chop Tank Rivers. So at the beginning, here are our oyster future stakeholders. They decided their goal was an economically viable, healthy, and sustainable Chop Tank and Little Chop Tank Rivers oyster fishery and ecosystem. And 60% of this group were from industry, including commercial fishermen, aquaculturists, and a seafood buyer. The other folks were from two from agencies and citizens and nonprofit groups. Um, they, uh, and at the end, two years later, after nine meetings on weekends, including Super Bowl Sunday, um, this is the stakeholder group. Most of the people were the same. And after coming to consensus, they were still smiling. So what happened, this is what it looked like. They were listening, thinking, and working together. Um, the key points here is that it was consensus driven. It was set up to come to consensus from the beginning. It was facilitated by professional facilitators. 60% um, of the folks were from industry, 20, but there, and there was a 75% agreement level. So any option for it to move forward needed 75% of the people to agree. And it was science-based. We did our best to bring in all the data we could and the stakeholders integrate their knowledge into in with the data in a, in a simulation model that they, they approved of and would use for their uh, for developing their recommendations. So how did the computer model support this process? Well, the stakeholders decided first on the options and outcomes that they wanted to be modeled. Um, for example, changing or rotating fishing areas, um, planting shells, fat on shell or reef balls, restoring reefs. And then we built a computer model that would allow them to compare those different options. They included economics, oyster biology, oyster habitat, and water quality. And then the model would forecast the outcomes that the stakeholders wanted. They wanted to know what happened to oyster abundance after 25 years, what would happen after oyster, for oyster habitat, harvest revenue, and nitrogen reduction for each of the different options. So what did the model options look like? Which ones did they end up choosing? So um, here on this graph, on the x-axis, you have years. So this is a forecast into the future, 25 years into the future. And on the y-axis, you have the percent change from the status quo. So this is status quo is like, if we did nothing, what would happen after 25 years? And over 100 op um, options were evaluated in the model. And these are the top ones that you see here. Um, uh, so after about 25 years, the model predicts up to a 44% increase 
and oyster abundance, which is great and, and allows us to isolate which of the options are really the best ones. So it forecasts this for many of the different harvest metrics or the many of the different metrics, including harvest. And this is my big Eureka moment for the whole, you know, hundreds of simulations that we did and hundreds of plots that we made for the stakeholders is here, the, um, the effect of these different options on harvest was really different. We, instead of a 44% increase, you could get as much as 120% increase or even a decrease. So essentially the management options had a stronger effect on harvest than on oyster populations. And to me, that means um, we really wanna be careful about what options we choose to restore oysters so that we do the most good and the least harm to our fishing communities. And it shows that there's a, there's a lot of things that we can do that do a lot of good. So here's another plot. Um, on the x-axis, we have increase in adult oysters, and on the y-axis, we have increase in harvest. And what I want you to focus on is this upper quadrant where you get the most oysters and the most increase in harvest. And the best options increase oyster abundances and harvest at the same time. And these uh, purple ones were combined options that included um, putting spat or shell or spat on shell in uh, harvest areas and finishing restoration and, and um, uh, enhancing enforcement among other things. So it's a, those purple dots, pay attention to the purple dots because this next slide shows the cost of each of these options on the x-axis and the increase in harvest revenue after 25 years. And again, in this upper quadrant, we see these purple ones show up and that the best options increased revenue to fishermen and were cost effective. Anything above this blue line is you get more um, revenue than you put in after 25 years annual investment. So, and then we did this again, same type of graph for cost per year on the x-axis and here on the y-axis is increase in value of nitrogen removal. So this is the social cost of how, how much it costs to remove nitrogen. And the best options increase nitrogen reduction and were cost effective. So um, this is great because there, this is win for the oyster resource, more oysters, more harvest revenue and more nitrogen reduction. So the stakeholders were able to really converge on those win-win-win solutions. So what were their recommendations? They made, this model uh, supported the recommendations that they made, but they didn't, the model wasn't their recommendations. They had a lot of text, a 12 page document that has very specific recommendations that um, were carefully crafted. They included um, enhanced enforcement, complete restoration, allow hand tonging in limited portions of sanctuaries, plant shell and spat on shell in harvest regions, place privately funded reef balls, explore limited entry, combine the above options, and use the consensus solution process in Maryland. It's it's a it's an amazing document and the stakeholders did so much work to get to this. I hope people will read it and, and really think about the details. So how influential were the stakeholders' recommendations? They, they submitted their report, this research report, um, of their recommendations as part of a research program to uh, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and ultimately, it has ended up in a new law. Uh, consensus is a new law for oysters in Maryland. Um, the bill that was passed earlier this year says the Department of Natural Resources shall convene, convene a stakeholder work group to develop a package of consensus recommendations for enhancing and implementing the fishery management plan for oysters. And as stated in the bill, 60% of the people at the table are from industry and 40% represent other important and involved stakeholder groups. So uh, carrying forward this balance of a representation, this process is underway and um, is quite exciting to be part of. So more in two years, you know, we, um, it's difficult during COVID, um, but the people at the table are really working hard and um, I have a lot of hope for this process. So in conclusion for this, what the research program, um, our conclusions are, is that consensus is possible. Process is important, it can, it can create or alleviate conflict. The consensus solution process is one of the types of process that can help create well thought out recommendations with broad stakeholder support. And that win-win-win solutions for the oyster, the industry and the environment can be found. What I learned from this is that no one owns the tree of truth. We all see one part of it. And when we work together with respect, when we listen and we are just kind to each other, we go a long way toward really 
getting a good picture of what's going on and being able to make solid decisions together about it. So I want to thank you uh, for your attention. There's more information on our webpage and Facebook page. Um, and I want to say many thanks to the Oyster Future stakeholders who came on weekends, including Super Bowl Sunday, to be part of this research pro process. It was um, amazing to see, and I appreciate their work and all the work of our research team and support staff that went into this, and of course, our funding agency, the National Science Foundation. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today, and thank you for Aaron Kornbluth with the Pew Charitable Trust for organizing this wonderful panel on strategic shellfish restoration planning efforts. I'm truly honored and pleased to be part of this group today talking with you about these efforts, and I've heard so many great suggestions from my colleagues. I look forward to incorporating some of them into our planning efforts here in North Carolina as we move forward. My name is Erin Fleckenstein. I am a coastal scientist and regional manager with the North Carolina Coastal Federation. For those of you who are not familiar with our organization, we are a private nonprofit that works to empower people from all walks of life in the stewardship of our coastal resources. We focus on improving coastal water quality and habitats such as estuary marsh and oyster reefs. We do this through our key program areas of environmental education, environmental advocacy, and habitat restoration and preservation. Today I'm going to be talking to you more about our work to develop a state restoration plan for oysters, which we commonly refer to as the oyster blueprint. As you've heard from my colleagues, oyster habitats are globally threatened, and the story is no different here in North Carolina. We attribute the decline in oyster population in our state to a couple threats. Primarily, and initially, the historic overharvest of the resource without returning enough substrate back to the water. Subsequent impacts to our oysters include habitat loss, impacts from natural disasters, low recruitment, shellfish disease and predation, as well as water quality de degradation. We do not currently have a stock assessment for our oyster population in North Carolina, but the state lists oysters as a species of concern in need of management. Actions have been taken in the state to build back our depleted resources for over a century. This timeline shows a very brief and generalized description of the work that's taken place over the last 105 years, in, beginning in 1915 when the state began to actively restore harvested shellfish bottom by planting culture material. In the 1990s, prompted by historic, continued historic low harvest, the General Assembly convened a Blue Ribbon Advisory Council on Oysters that made recommendations related to the best management of our oyster population and best ways to restore oysters on public beds. They also made recommendations about how to build our oyster aquaculture industry, managing our oyster resource, and other recommendations related to maximizing production and building back an oyster industry in the state. Subsequent plans and efforts have come from what is now known as the Breakel Report, including the Fisheries Reform Act, an oyster fishery management plan, and a coastal habitat and protection planning effort. In 2003, the Coastal Federation, along with partners from North Carolina Sea Grant, the Aquariums, North Carolina Estuary Research Reserve, Albemarle Pamlico Estuarine Partnership, Environmental Defense, Duke University Marine Lab, the Nature Conservancy, and others joined together to host a series of meetings which has become, to, which is known as the Oyster Forum. Through these meetings, the partners came together to look at and compile suggested actions from all of these various planning efforts to see where the synergies lie between the Breakel Report, the Fisheries Reform Act, the Fisheries Management Plan, Coastal Habitat Protection Plan, and the Basin Water, water Quality Planning efforts. And looking at the synergies and common set of goals and actions was compiled, which came to be known as the Oyster Blueprint. This effort was really looking at breaking down the actions between these different agencies and organizations, between these different plans, and finding ways that all of these efforts could work together for common purpose and a common goal. Fostering collaboration and partnership were among the major tenets of this effort. To date, three Oyster Blueprints have been released, each one building on the successes and actions of the previous edition. We are currently in the process of updating the plan to its fourth edition. What have been some of the keys to the success of the Blueprint effort? And how have we gone about planning for work in North Carolina? Glad you asked. I'll have to tell you a little bit more about that. So first of all, I really can't stress this enough, but partnerships and collaborations have been very much key and central to the success of the blueprint planning effort. This slide here shows you a variety of organizations and businesses that have been part of the Oyster Blueprint plan development. This is not a comprehensive list of all of the groups that have been involved, but rather is meant to show you the depth and breadth of groups that have been at the table helping to cultivate and develop this plan as we move forward. In addition to these partnerships and collaborations, 
We have had several other elements that have contributed to the success of this blueprint planning effort, including having key leaders at the table in developing the plan. The plan boasts leadership, including a statewide steering committee, as well as regional work groups that are made up of key agencies, stakeholders, and researchers that engage to advance and prioritize the efforts that are undertaken through the blueprint effort. This plan is owned by all. The process is NGO driven, in this case, the Coastal Federation, and we have no real sway over the agency partners, but because the plan is organic and grassroots driven, unbounded by more formal state planning efforts, consensus can be achieved in a way that cultivates and allows for the plan to be embraced by many. This process also allows the plan to be adaptable and to change as adaptable as changes arise, and it provides a way that policy and funding suggestions are able to be put forward with care and thought to the implications of those suggested actions. In addition to our key leadership, we also have excellent participation from many of our state agencies and involve key federal partners such as NOAA. The plan is scientifically based and driven due to the engagement of five universities and a federal research institution that exists here on the coast of North Carolina. All of these groups together bring their knowledge, their monitoring, and their research to bear on the goals and actions that are undertaken through the plan. The blueprint incorporates actions and dovetails with other state planning efforts. This helps break down the silos between agencies and allows us to engage elements from the various planning efforts to elevate them and find synergies between the work. Because of the way it dovetails with these other planning efforts, it is a comprehensive plan, looking at all aspects of oyster restoration and protection, from building new reefs, to managing habitat, building harvestable reefs for, to support the wild fishery, promoting shellfish aquaculture, and protecting water quality. In addition, there is considerable thought that goes into outreach, engagement, research, and policy initiatives that are needed to advance the goals of the blueprint. The actions that are derived from the plan are all voluntary. This is a key element as it allows our partners and collaborators to engage from a wide variety of backgrounds in the advancement of the oyster restoration and protection efforts in the state. The process is very open and fluid. The planning meetings are open to all and are designed to allow for engagement at multiple levels and at multiple times in the plan development. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we've gone about updating our fourth edition of the blueprint. So this graphic shows you sort of the three phases that we've gone through in updating the fourth edition. In this time we've incorporated an assessment phase, a planning phase that we are currently in the middle of, and then we will move to implementation in the next year. As part of our assessment, we began by looking at past accomplishments. We also conducted a stakeholder survey and we developed strategic work groups that put forth recommendations for what to include in the next edition of the Blueprint. Every year for the past four years, we have published a State of the Oyster Report that details the work of the partners, um, de details the work that the partners have taken to advance the Blueprint. This year, since it's the last year of the, blueprint, the current edition of the Blueprint, we're compiling all five years worth of progress into one final report. Having this report allows us as partners to document the work that occurred during the last edition of the Blueprint and helps us to communicate the benefits of the plan and the accomplishments of the plan to others. In addition to the report, a website, ncoysters.org, and social media presences have been launched to further the communications efforts around the plan. In addition to looking at our past accomplishments, we also conducted a stakeholder survey. Through the survey, it, we were designing it to solicit feedback from our stakeholders on their perceived benefits from oysters, perceived threats to our oyster population in the next five to 10 years, as well as suggestions for actions that should be undertaken to bring back and revive our oyster population in the state. The survey results were summarized and this document is available on ncoysters.org backslash 2020 blueprint update if you're interested in reading more about the results of that stakeholder survey. The survey was sent to 671 people and we received approximately 166 and we received 166 responses, which is approximately a 24% response rate. As part of the survey and new to this edition of the Blueprint, we tried to get a better understanding of how the ecosystem services provided by oysters were perceived as a benefit to our stakeholders, which ones were considered most valuable. And as we move forward with the next edition of the Blueprint, we're going to be working to develop our goals and actions to achieve ecosystem outcomes. In addition to the survey, as part of the assessment phase, we formed work groups that were topical in nature. Each of the work groups was comprised of um, experts and stakeholders of the topic area, and they joined together to look at these seven topical areas. 
The seven strategies include oyster sanctuaries, habitat management, cultural planting, shellfish aquaculture, protecting shellfish waters, living shorelines, and education and outreach. These work groups summarized information about their strategy, including why it was important to include in the next edition of the blueprint, looking at past accomplishments, as well as putting forth suggested actions that should be prioritized for the coming blueprint. A common vision for the blueprint was developed with input from the Oyster Steering Committee. The, for the fourth edition of the blueprint, our vision is to foster collaboration among partners, ensuring oysters in North Carolina perpetuate a healthy and robust environment and economy. Once we had all of these elements in hand, a summary of our past work, the results of the stakeholder survey, the work group recommendations, and a common vision, we moved to the plan drafting phases of the Blueprint Update. We had planned for an in-person workshop this past spring as part of the Blueprint Update process, where we would review the recommendations from the work groups and prioritize them. Well, COVID had a different plan for us. When we weren't able to host the two-day in-person workshop as planned, we moved to a virtual platform. We very quickly retooled the agenda and engagement strategies to accommodate this virtual experience, and we held a series of two-hour virtual meetings. The work group recommendations were posted in advance on ncoysters.org. During the meetings, the presenters moved through the recommendations from the different work groups, and our meeting facilitators made use of the chat box functions, virtual polling, and also solicited feedback through email on the recommendations that were presented. From each of the workshops, we walked away with an understanding of the top three priority actions for each of the strategies. All in all, we had nearly 150 unique individuals participate in the workshops. We took all of this information back to our Oyster Steering Committee this summer and asked them to review the recommended actions from the work groups, the priority actions from the workshops, and the other information we had gathered. The Steering Committee then moved through the plan and outlined where they felt key organizations would help to move and advance suggested actions forward. Since that Steering Committee meeting, we've been working to put all of the elements from the plan into a draft blueprint. We envision being able to release this draft document to the public this fall for their review and input. And then we'll reconvene our steering committee later this winter to review any of the feedback we receive and to move to a final document. We hope to be able to host a public launch and unveiling of the next edition of the blueprint sometime in 2021. Of course, how that launch event is structured will be dependent on whether social distancing measures are still in place. We have ideas for how this could play out as both an in-person event as well as a more virtual or social media driven event or some combination of the two. All in all, this update to the blueprint has engaged several hundred people in the crafting of the goals and actions. We have learned a few lessons along the way. One being that as much engagement and outreach as we have done, there is always an opportunity to do more. The more support and buy-in we can get in the crafting of the plan helps to create more ownership and therefore more advocates for the plan as we move to its implementation. Educating our political and policy leaders is a particular opportunity that we have identified. Furthermore, we've had great support from our state legislators as well as federal granting agencies, but keeping consistent and growing funding to allow these priorities to move forward is a critical need. All in all, I'm quite proud of our process here in North Carolina, and I'm confident knowing that with all of the brilliant and dedicated minds that have been engaged in this process, we will make great strides to revive the oyster population in North Carolina and return oysters to their economic and environmental glory. With that, I would like to make sure to thank all of the Oyster Steering Committee members, work group and workshop participants that have been instrumental in the development of this fourth edition of the Oyster Blueprint. And I had to put everyone on two slides because there were so many people, but it really has been a tremendous outpouring of support in the development of this next edition of the Blueprint. Thank you all very much. And I'm back. A big thanks, first of all, to my co-panelists for sharing their experiences. I'm reminded of one of the first conversations that the five of us had when we began developing the session and how each of us agreed how valuable it was for us to be sharing lessons learned, restoration techniques, points of contact, and many other aspects of this work, since in many ways the approaches that we're taking are similar and in many ways they're different. It would seem to be to us an area where there's a lot of opportunity for increased collaboration. My colleagues at PUNI are working with a number of states nationwide to help them develop such shellfish restoration plans at both estuary specific and state levels. I am personally working with the states of New York, Connecticut, and Rhode Island to help them develop such plans that will hopefully be useful in restoring shellfish habitat, improving water quality, stabilizing shorelines, and enhancing shellfish for wild harvest fisheries. Restoration plans like the ones that we've discussed today are intended to help scale up existing restoration efforts 
which often occur in isolation. That makes sense, right? People tend to focus on the places where they live, not only because they have local knowledge or data, but also because they're attached to that place. Beyond unifying existing shellfish restoration efforts, restoration plans can also be used to begin large-scale restoration anew, where the desire is for more than one restoration project to be implemented, or where there is more than one restoration goal. There are a few what I'll call risks to developing such plans, like competition among stakeholders for limited funding or attention, for example, from the media or the agencies that signed your permits, and for space to do restoration on the water. Developing these plans isn't, and probably frankly shouldn't be quick and easy because there are so many aspects to consider. Planning forces us to ask hard questions and to try to come up with creative solutions. And we risk really putting ourselves out there during these processes especially when we engage new partners who might see the world differently and have different restoration goals. And also because these plans may end up impacting the restoration that's already taking place. For example, by requiring the use of new restoration or monitoring techniques. But I think my panelists would agree with me that the benefits far outweigh the risks. Plans help us to establish new baselines, things like the status of the resource or status of restoration, the status of forcing factors like environmental conditions and disease, or the status of shellfish fisheries. These plans can, and probably ideally should, be designed to improve existing restoration projects, for example, by making more cult available to use for settlement, or models that can help us to better understand the impacts on nearby non-restored populations. Well-designed plans increase the ROI by a number of means. My colleagues and I at Pew are particularly interested in the concept of using restoration plans to develop interconnected networks of restored and wild populations that can then become self-sustaining through larval transport. This will be among the topics covered in the presentation, Employing Sound Science and Stakeholder Engagement for Resilient Oyster Restoration and Sustainability that immediately follows this session. Plans require those engaged to think outside the box, exploring the use of new restoration techniques or new partnerships with less obvious groups like maybe shellfish farmers, who are certainly experts when it comes to growing shellfish. One example of this so-called conservation aquaculture approach is for growers to produce shellfish that will then be used on nearby restoration sites, an approach that the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is paying some growers to do, and with good effect. Plans can be attractive to important external groups like permitting authorities, funders, the media, and the broader public. And plans through their implementation should ideally result in decisions that are more durable, for example, by resulting in improved regulation or the creation of new protected areas or harvestable reefs. There's a spectrum of approaches to developing large-scale restoration plans, from those that are top-down, mandated by decision makers with a narrowly defined order of operations, to open and evolving processes that engage stakeholders early and often, as has been the case in North Carolina. The order of operations listed here is certainly not written in stone, and I'm possibly missing a few elements, but these are some of the key components that today's panelists and others have identified as being important to include in restoration plans. And importantly, I emphasize that such plans and their implementation should be iterative. At the outset of these processes, it's important to ID which species you're going to focus on and why. It might be easier to start with one species and see how it goes as Rhode Island is planning to do by focusing first on oysters. And it might also be easier to limit the scope of the restoration goals. Rather than trying to fit everything into one big initial plan, the focus can be on enhancing ecosystem services or on enhancing wild harvest. Another approach would be to throw everything in there as a goal, but to create a more structured, prioritized action plan that can guide implementation based upon an agreed upon list of priorities. Some key challenges include engaging the right stakeholders in the right ways at the right times, poaching of restoration sites, transmission of disease, which is a very real threat and one that is often hard to track, and therefore probably worthwhile including in the development of a restoration plan, addressing user conflicts, cultivating champions to lead the development of these plans, and then to carry them into the implementation phases, permitting, funding, using catcheries to provide larvae and seed, and the availability of cult or other substrate. It's important to conduct assessments to the best degree possible to inform restoration plans. Several of the panelists today discussed the factors that went into creating their so-called inventories. Additional consideration should also be given to whether restoration can or should occur in closed versus open waters and why. There are different benefits and risks associated with each approach. Plans should reflect on whether it makes the most sense 
biologically, ecologically, socially, economically, to stick with tried and tested approaches to shellfish restoration, or to start using more novel techniques. And I'll add that it's important to be realistic about the scale at which you hope to achieve restoration. This one may seem obvious, but it's all too easy to imagine that a plan, when implemented, will bring us back to some long disappeared historic abundance. Based on today's presentations and experience, this is a key consideration that really deserves its own slide. The list of types of stakeholders need not include just the usual subjects, but can include students, people from non-shellfish fisheries, ecotourism and bait and tackle businesses, the diving and restaurant communities, and others, at least in part because each of these groups can bring something to the table that the other groups cannot, and because each of these groups can then be involved in on-the-water restoration. Numerous experiences indicate that it's important to include stakeholders early and often. That buys plan development leaders a lot of good things, even though it can be hard to do. The ways to engage stakeholders are numerous and growing. In the face of COVID, several of the states with which I'm working will likely use virtual engagement opportunities like webinars, surveys, and interactive online mapping tools. One final consideration when engaging stakeholders is just how open and or voluntary their participation is. The approaches in North Carolina and Maryland have been particularly inclusive, while other experiences have been more prescribed with specific engagement opportunities. Funding is another topic that really deserves its own slide. Some of you might be thinking that devoting funding to restoration plan development might take away from the dollars available to do the actual on the water restoration. That's not necessarily the case. Planning can, in, and in my mind should, be used to identify new funding sources. While restoration project financing has traditionally been through public grants or private philanthropy, there are new sources that are emerging, sometimes in the most unusual places. I'm thinking right now of the Billion Oyster Project's partnership with Talisker Whiskey, which is supporting BOP's efforts to collect and cure oyster shells from across New York City. Would less obvious funders like that support the development of rest restoration plans? I don't know, but I'll bet that few have ever asked. More and more we hear about funders becoming interested in funding restoration plan development because they see it as a way to scale up the successful smaller scale projects. And yes, since plans and their implementation aren't cheap, often multiple sources of funding are necessary. But these can be broken out into discrete areas as Rhode Island is doing for its social versus ecological data collection efforts. Lastly, two obvious but often hard to do things are to get to know the community of funders and what they value and to demonstrate to them that there's progress being made that could be enhanced through the creation of large-scale comprehensive restoration plans. So why now? Restoration efforts are on the rise for purposes of ecosystem service and fisheries enhancements, but shellfish remain in decline in so many places for numerous reasons, and those threats aren't going away. Instead of responding to crises, it's best to start while there is still a higher degree of hope for restoration success. We should take advantage of the positive push towards more restoration. I'd argue that the numerous examples of successful projects and the availability of so many new restoration tools and techniques puts us in a great position to scale shellfish restoration. North Carolina, going through its fourth iteration of the Oyster Blueprint, is a great example of a state revisiting and revising its approach based on new data, tools, and partnerships. The process of developing plans is often the experience that gets those restoration practices, science, data, and tools on the table for restoration practitioners to actually start using or to use better. And although it's often hard, planning can help to reduce user conflicts if the process is structured in such a way that all participants feel valued and heard and that their preferences and recommendations are ultimately addressed in the plan and in its implementation. I think the Maryland Oyster Futures example is one where this concept was really put to the test to the benefit of those involved. Lastly, before the Q&A, I want to leave you with just a few resources that I hope you'll find useful if you and your colleagues decide you want to develop a new or improve an existing shellfish restoration plan. Start by checking out other examples of such plans, such as NOAA's Shellfish Initiative, or Georgia's Oyster Restoration Strategic Plan, or Washington's Olympia Oyster Restoration Plan. Check out the various how-to guides that are out there that have informed shellfish restoration both domestically and globally. And though these guides don't tend to focus on plan development per se, there are many elements within them that are relevant. I'd also suggest that you do as much as possible to get to know your sense of place. Geospatial data are becoming more widely available, but they can be hard to find. One place that I often look is Esri's ArcGIS Online. And of course, don't forget to talk to the experts. People who have or are doing this, like today's panelists, for example. Talk to your state extension agents, like those at Sea Grant or NRCS, 
The Maryland approach is a great example of not trying to go it alone or to reinvent the wheel. And groups with such expertise in facilitating plan development are out there. Lastly, I'd like to again thank my co-panelists and to thank you as well for joining this session. All right, hello everybody. Thank you for attending our session today. Um, I just wanna check with my co-panelists that you can actually hear me. All right, very good, very good. Well, first, uh, big thanks once again to my co-panelists. Um, it was a great uh, compilation of related uh, and, and also separate uh, ongoing work to restore shellfish in your states respectively. Um, I wanna start by thanking Ray, CSO, and Save the Bay for hosting this summit, despite all of the challenges in doing it virtually. I think thus far, based on my personal experience, it seems to be going quite well. Um, I want to reiter reiterate the value of collaborating on types of, on uh, restoration efforts like the ones that we've discussed today. Um, when the five of us first got together to talk about this work, uh, one of the things that we all agreed upon was that uh, the five of us very simply might want to touch base after this panel today as part of the summit uh, to delve a little bit deeper, to share more of some of our lessons learned, um, to share more cool new technologies, tools, mapping information, and partnership opportunities. Um, so I think the five of us plan on doing that, and I would encourage any of you attendees out there to engage in some similar types of uh, cross-organizational, cross-state uh, even cross uh, national boundary uh, conversations to collaborate on this type of work. Um, all right, we're gonna go into the Q&A right now. Um, I am going to pose a question, uh, first of all, and then I'll get to the audience questions. Um, I'm wondering if each of the four of you would be willing to briefly provide one particularly thorny issue that you either have dealt with, as in the case of the North Carolina and Maryland examples, or anticipate dealing with in the Rhode Island and New York examples that you think is gonna be really particularly thorny to deal with while you're going through the planning process and how you would anticipate crafting the process, actually designing the plan development or implementation process so that that issue is addressed. And why don't we start with Elizabeth, uh, from the Maryland Oyster Futures perspective. <laughs> okay, I think I'm going to go first. Well, um, there's lots of there's lots of thorny issues. Um, one of the one of the ones that has been uh, complicated in Chesapeake for a is uh, the use of alternative substrates, which to use and when to use it, when to use it, and how often those kind of things. And I think. Um, what I've learned from the process of Oyster Futures and kind of the facilitators really who, who taught me a lot about um, working with people and then to try to address it early um, and often and, um, I, you know, with, uh, uh, let people talk, talk it out and um, use breakout groups, things like that. And I think, um, and trying to get uh, the best information together for people too. So, so that be my answer. All right, great. Um, Eric, how about you next? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, I think at least thorny, challenging, something that we're really cognizant of. And you did a nice job summarizing it towards the end of your um, final slides and kind of your summary presentation is really um, stakeholder engagement. And so, you know, Throughout our previous restoration processes, this has been something that we've really challenged with in terms of how stakeholders have been engaged, when they're engaged. And although we're certainly very cognizant of this, you know, we're actively um, developing approaches that we think will help us not only approve, but you know, have a successful shellfish restoration plan that really engages stakeholders and maintains it throughout. I, you know, um, I'm to be perfectly honest, I'm, you know very conscious that this is something that we need to really focus on and make sure that you know we utilize all the skills of our collective partners to ensure that stakeholders 
not only are engaged and are supportive of the shellfish restoration and enhancement plan process, but that we're able to maintain them, um, their support, you know, once we get to the implementation stage. All right, great, thank you. Um, Aaron, how about you next? Sure, yeah, so we've, you know, we're in our fourth edition of the Oyster Blueprint and we've been, I would say, relatively lucky as far as having conflict, but um, if I had to pick out one conflict, it would be in spatial planning and conflicting uses. Um, we have a relatively undeveloped coastline, so it's, it's maybe not as, um, at the forefront as places like New York City and what have you, but certainly making sure that restoration, aquaculture, wild harvest and water quality are, are balanced in their um, priorities is, is really critical to, and making sure people have a voice at the table to, to, to express their concerns and to feel honestly heard and, um, and have their considerations really you know, taken to heart. So I would say that's probably been our biggest lesson learned is reaching out to the communities as much as we possibly can, always trying to, to build out and find new contacts, making sure that people have voices at the table, that they're included in the planning process. And, um, and also we've, also, I will say that, you know, one of the other things we found is it, there's really key champions in each of the communities that it's important to engage with that can really carry the message and, and act as spokespeople for their, particular constituency and, and that's sometimes hard to identify, but um, you know, doing our best to try and reach out and engage and build relationships with those key champions in the different um, stakeholder groups is also something that we've put a lot of energy into, so. All right, great. And least, not last, not, I'm sorry. Least and last, it's fine. Yes. The, uh, thanks, Aaron, and thanks everybody. Um, I think, you know, there's obviously a million different thorny issues, but uh, a real challenge for us is the sort of tale of two states, because you have in New York, you know, the the relative to the size of the state, the relevant coastline area is very small, and it's sort of New York City and Long Island, and they're so different um, in sort of needs, uh, competing uses, regulatory framework, all of that. So I think a big challenge for us is going to be to get everyone, you know moving together towards the same goals with such different, um, you know, contexts. And so that's, uh, and I guess how we're we gonna do that, I think it's about, you know, for all of us involved, it's about taking our, you know, heads out of the sand and looking at the horizon and trying to think, you know, what what's best five, 10, 15 years, 20 years down the line, instead of, you know, how are we gonna, you know, make payroll next month, which is a, a, a real challenge. Um, but yeah, that's what I'd say. Great. Well, thank you for. Um, all right, I'm going to turn to audience questions now. We have one. With the idea of engaging key champions, how do you avoid fatigue for those people who are often asked to help engage their communities on lots of different issues? Um, why don't we start with Aaron? <laughs> that's a great question. How do you avoid fatigue? Um, I would say that, that that's probably another big challenge that we have is that not only are we asking those key champions to participate at multiple um, engagement opportunities, but also agencies are being asked to engage in multiple ways that are outside of maybe their normal duties. So it's it's a real issue and I don't know that we've hit on the, the perfect solution for that, um, but just I guess being aware of and cognizant of people's limited capacity and and giving them an out saying, I understand you may not be able to contribute at this time, but is there someone else you can recommend that would be, you know, a good spokesperson or could also help us engage? And, and just, yeah, being aware that people are human and they only have but so much time and energy to give. I think that's a good response. Thank you. Um, Eric, what are your thoughts? Um, as a state agency, organ, um, government official yourself, uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I, you know, I, I agree with, with Aaron's. I think it's, you know, it is really challenging. People are, are very busy. I'm sure some of the things we engage, not just in terms of fatigue, but really is the funding to prevent fatigue. And so ensuring that, you know, partners have the ability 
to participate, not just you know state resource management agencies, but our partners that they're able to maintain the funding to engage um, and stay engaged. And in terms of fatigue, um, going back to the core of the question, um, you know, again, I think Aaron said it well. Ensuring that you know there, your group is large enough, and that as people need to either focus on other aspects or they can't participate in a given aspect, but there's someone else who can still represent, um, you know, a given set of stakeholders or a community. And so that that group doesn't just fall out because in our experience, once you fall out, it's it can definitely be challenging to get them back, but there's, you know, you spend a lot of time and resources trying to bring everyone back up to speed. So if you, if you have approaches that can avoid that, you know, it's great for everyone. Pete, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, I think for the, you know, sort of state officials and regulators, it's in, in that role, it's really hard to, you know, it's sort of a no win role. You, you know, you just, there's no upside. And so providing positive stories um, and positive ways to collaborate and is a, I think a, is, has great value. You know, the folks who spend their careers trying to prevent bad things from happening to the environment, I think is, is more exhausting than having the opportunity to have some, to create a, a positive outcome. And so providing those positive stories and ways to engage that's exciting and interesting and, you know, shows real progress. Um, I, I, you know, that's, that's sort of our, our, our model. All right, and Elizabeth. Um, I know you didn't know I left it now. Um, uh, well, I was kind of hoping to answer some of the specific questions from the, the chat. So should I just ask people to send, because we're about out of time. Should I just ask people to send me their questions by email? And then um, their specific questions, and then I can answer this idea of, of fatigue. Yes, sure. We can okay. we can address some of the questions that we might not get to offline. Sure. Yeah, sure. So if anyone had questions about OSHA features, thank you very much for your interest. I'd be happy to answer them over email. And I will try to copy and paste, but if you send them to me by email, that would be easier. And um, uh, I, I think people are often called on to speak for their community because they're very good at speaking for their community. And the idea of how do we develop more young people, engage young people, and almost have them uh, learn their skills? Um, is, is an open question, and, and how do you um, learn from your spokesman? I think would be a, a good thing. I don't have that much to offer for that question. So. All right, thank you. And with just a couple minutes left, uh, we have a question. With such large restoration projects, are there concerns about maintaining genetic diversity or concerns of supply of shell? Yes. Is that an across the board yes? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that makes sense. All right. Um, Maybe one quick final question we can squeeze in. Uh, this question was originally directed to Billion Oyster Project, but I think it could be relevant to all four of you. Um, have you thought of supplementing your restoration work uh, with spat or adult oysters even from aquaculture? And Pete, do you want to take that question first? Yeah, sure. So um, you know, there's very, very little, there's a very small wild oyster population in New York Harbor. So almost all of our installations are supplemented with uh, culture oysters that we grow on Governor's Island or bring in from other hatcheries, usually as as larvae, um, and, and we you know use that to create spat on shell. We have done some work of uh, relocating oysters from uh, you know larger oysters from uh, oyster farms out on Long Island onto our projects more recently, uh, but that so the answer is yes. Um, we are almost always putting live oysters on our on our installations. Anybody else? I can I can briefly echo Pete's comments. So in Rhode Island, again, there's very very limited uh, remnant wild populations. Almost all of the work we do is focused on um, not only improving substrate but also providing um, usually seed oysters. Um, and although that's largely 
initially was a result of trying to use um, hatchery lineages or hatchery, uh, let's say restoration lineages from hatcheries. We've been doing research, you know, directly in partnership with Randall Hughes's lab at Northeastern um, to try to assess how different lineages are going to perform on a number of different attributes in terms of survival and genetic. And so we were shifting into slowly having the capacity through hatcheries to introduce some of the wild with an understanding of how they're going to perform relative to some of the other lineages. All right, great. And that is our time. Thanks again to my co-panelists. That was fun working on working on this with you. And thanks, of course, to Ray, CSO, and our attendees. Take care. Thanks. Bye.